All right, let's get started then. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Em. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we are so thrilled to be hosting tonight's main author talk. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's speaker. Gregory Brown grew up along Penobscot Bay and still lives in Maine with his family. His work often explores the interaction of land and human influence with a particular interest on social, cultural, and environmental issues. His short fiction has appeared in Tin House, the Alaska Quarterly Review, Shenandoah, Epoch, and Narrative Magazine, where he was a winner of the 30 Below Prize. He is the recipient of several scholarships and fellowships and is a graduate of Columbia University, where he studied journalism and the Iowa Writers Workshop, where he studied fiction writing. The Lowering Days is his first novel. Speaking of the book, Richard Russo said, in The Lowering Days, Gregory Brown gives a lush, almost mythic portrait of a very specific place and time that feels all the more universal for its singularity. There's magic here. And I'll turn it over to Greg, who we are so happy again to introduce. Um, can you give us a sense of your story and why you wanted to tell it through uh, uh, reading of it from the opening? Sure, of course. Um, thank you for the lovely introduction to, um, I appreciate it. So yeah, I, I, I guess um, what I'll just do is, is start off by reading um, a quick passage from the beginning of the book. It kind of, you know, brings us all into the world of the book. Um, it works for those who have read the book and those who haven't. And it kind of, you know, introduces some themes and just, just the place that's at the heart of the, this novel. One, we were wild kids, always covered in river dirt and sweat. In every corner of the house, one could see our passing. Ochre footprints slapped across kitchen floorboards, sand spilling from our beds, mud from our hands smeared along cabinets and door handles, and the hulls of the miraculous boats our father built. With the windows thrown open in summer to the river and the calling of owls and coyotes and wood frogs, it sometimes felt like the line between the world inside and the world outside vanished. Perhaps that's why my brothers and I never questioned our parents' ability to summon each other back from short and great distances. It wasn't until I was grown that I realized this was unusual at all. Certain cultures believe a song or a chant voiced in one place can be heard in another place many miles away. Passamaquoddy people talk of Motowolan, ones with extraordinary spiritual powers who can hear for great distances. All these years later, I am still convinced my parents carried some similar summoning magic. And while I don't have the language for such a thing, I know only this, love should always be able to call love back. That seems simple enough to us as children. My name is David Ulmer and Ames. The other day I woke with a sudden need to make sense of old things before more new things came on. I guess this isn't so unusual. By giving myself permission to freely survey the lives I grew up among, moving from one household into another much like the river that surrounded us, I'm hoping to stand in the flow of history without being crushed by its weight. I'm a doctor now, and while one might think I'd seen enough absurdity to throw my hands up to time and chance, the secret curse of being a caregiver is the hunger for control. Every malady has a potential cure if you get to it soon enough. So it is that I've often thought about what could have been stopped had I gotten between my father and Lyman Creel when I was a teenager. But I'm talking now of mystical things, of surreal places and impossible tasks. To begin the right way, we must start with the Penobscot. I think I'll stop there. Excellent. Thanks so much, Greg. Of course. Um, to start off, the novel is set in the Penobscot River Valley where you grew up and yes. tells the story of several families living in a fictionalized mill town. Um, what was on your mind while you were writing about home, a bit, admittedly a fictional version of it? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I feel like a lot of things, like, so I grew up in Belfast and I feel like I had been kind of gathering material for this book for a long, long time with, without an, an entirely realizing it. And I, you know, I was out in grad school in Iowa City. I was focusing mostly on short stories at the time. And I, I found my fiction returning more and more to Maine the longer I was out there. Um, I had been writing about Maine, but I'd been writing about other places as well. And shortly after I graduated, and then I was there for a third year of fellowship. And then I, you know, my daughter was born in Iowa City and I realized like I wanted to come back home and raise her here. So I moved back to Maine. And as soon as I got here, um, these, these three brothers kind of emerged as characters. 
in the story of these, these two families that are in conflict with each other. Um, and, for, and for me, I just was kind of following where those arcs were going. And I found that like notes I'd been taking about the area, about tensions in the area, um, you know, about what it means to like live in mid coast Maine and to have a deep long connection to mid coast Maine, but also have an awareness that mid coast Maine is a borrowed place like all of the US is for, for anybody who's not indigenous. Those things started kind of coming up more and more in my fiction. Um, and ultimately it led, it led to the lowering days. It was um, a very long process of, um, I've often described it as like writing a love letter to the place I'm from, albeit a fictionalized version of that place. But you know, there's, there's definitely, um, locations in the book that are obviously very much based on real places in the mid coast. Now you, you mentioned the mill um, and it's kind of a thinly veiled version of Bucksport. And I remember talking to my mom when I was writing the book and I'm like, I'm going to burn down a mill in Bucksport. I don't know, like, I wonder how that'll go over with, 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 with some Mainers. So. Yeah, sort of a drawing off of that. Um... Many of the issues you discuss in the book are very familiar to those who grew up in small towns in Maine, and especially those who grew up or had family um, that grew up in the shadow of mill towns and paper mills. And there's this idea of the paper mill and as a thing that's sort of breathing economic life into the community at the same time as it's killing its residents, as it's poisoning the environment around it. Um, and how did that economic history sort of tie into the story for you? Yeah, well, I, mean, I think like growing up in a you know a largely working class family, and you know having like like going way back, you know on my mom's side, um, you know a lot of my you know relatives and ancestors have been had been loggers, French Canadian loggers, and we all have this this history of relationship with the land, or a lot of us do in Maine. And I think there's this kind of misconception sometimes that somebody who is a logger or does something that works with the land in an extractive way or is a mill worker isn't like an environmentalist. And I, I totally disagree with that. Like some of like the, the staunchest lovers of the land that I've known are people who, who work in the timber industry. So what, what interested me was like this kind of line people have to walk where you have to harm the thing that you love dearly in order to put food on the table and you have to find a way to live with that and you have to find a way also to not be judged by that or judged for that and again and again like one of the things that comes up for the characters in the lowering days is they're they're often judged by their community and so, sometimes unfairly and sometimes justly and that leads to these kind of cycles of resentment as i like to call them that i see in a lot of rural communities not just in maine um, where one person feels like they're being unfairly treated or they're getting less than another and they lash out against one group and there's always this kind of mindset of scarcity like there isn't enough to go around for everybody so I witnessed a lot of that growing up and I just, I witnessed to that, that pattern of having to harm the thing you love the most to survive and, you know, keep your, your children fed and a roof over your head. And that creates an incredible internal conflict for people that I think is really rich to explore in fiction. So um, it was always going to be a big part of, of like kind of the undercurrent of the characters' lives in the lowering days. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. So much of that is going to be generational too. Like you oh, have absolutely. Younger, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. And and like, it, it's totally generational. And um, yeah, it, it's not something that's going to go away in Maine, both like the, the harm people have done and how they carry that forward to, to future generations and also generations depending on, on the land for livelihood and industry. Um, and I think there's ways to have better balance and more sustainable practices and we're working hard, I think, at the federal and state level for those things, but there's still going to be a dependence on land, I think, for livelihood in Maine for a, a long time. As there should be. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, sort of tying into that. Um, the book is filled with memorable young people, especially tying into this Thank sort you. of generational divide. Um, we have our narrator, David, who's looking back on his youth in the 80s, and Molly, who is the charismatic young girl who decides to burn down the paper mill rather than seeing her father go back to work there. Um, can you tell us why you decided to center so much of the, the story on the town's children, as opposed to perhaps the people who are working in the mill at the time? Yeah, um, that's a good question. You know, that's not a question I've been asked a lot, too, so that's cool. Um, I, I think for me, I remember like being a kid and just, I was a really shy kid. So I was always watching. I was always observing and trying to find a like a place to butt in and also like a way to butt in, figuring out what to say. 
And I, I think one of the things that's beautiful and also frustrating about childhood is that quality of being an observer and being passive, right? You know, you're always taking things in, you're always, you're privy to things, but you sometimes don't have the agency or you don't have the ability to do anything, to act, you know, you're kind of beholden to adults. So I knew for a long time that uh, kids or young people would be a focus on this story one, because I think they're great lens into seeing what's really happening in a community. Um, and I think they're great eavesdroppers. So, so they make wonderful like the people for kind of hearing what adults are up to and adults might not want them to, to hear. Uh, so that was part of it. And the other thing is there is a, a struggle between the generations in the book. Like I talked a little bit about kind of cycles of violence and resentment. And one of the things that David um, or Almi, the narrator and his two brothers and also Molly um, and the, the Creole children who were the other family in the book, they're all kind of struggling with is how to trade those cycles of resentment for kind of a, a path of forgiveness or compassion. Um, and that's ultimately like David's biggest challenge by the end of the book is how does he forgive Lyman for some of the things that Lyman does. So I just thought that internal struggle of, of trying to come to terms with and not necessarily like forgive, but figure out a better and more compassionate way to be was really interesting. Um, like there's sometimes too much of a, I think an emphasis put on forgiveness for wrongs, um, but you can still have compassion and an openness to, to being different. So like my rambling answer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I like that. That it's this idea of, of um, sort of reframing what happened in your mind, trying to come yeah. to it. Yeah, totally. yeah, absolutely. And so much of the what happens in the book is sort of morally ambigu ambiguous, um, especially Molly's actions, um, right. which blur the line between sort of what the state would consider a crime and what some might consider an act of justice. Um, can you tell us a bit about Molly's character and why she comes to that action and sort of what's her thinking behind that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's one of the things at the center of the book, and Carrie Arsenal, she reviewed it in the, the Boston Globe, and she really picked up on this in a sharp way, um, just like the heart of it is this question of like, what is a crime? And it, it runs again and again, like, you know, is, is the mill itself, the original sin, like extracting from, from the environment and harming the land, or is the greater crime like burning down the mill um, later on in the book, or, or not even later, but, you know, desertion in the Vietnam War play a big part in the book. And, you know, what's, what's the crime, like leaving the war, deserting the war, or the war itself? Um, so there's all these kind of like questions of, uh, what, what's the real right? What's the real wrong? If such a thing exists, but yeah. So for for Molly, um, you know, Molly's a Penobscot teenager. Uh, she has been raised primarily, well, really entirely by her father Adam, and um, you know, she's watched him have to work at the mill to to survive, to put food on the table, to live. Uh, when the the mill closes and goes bankrupt, he gets kind of put out of his job, and you know, the fear for Molly once. There's a couple of fears, but the, one of the big fears is once the, the mill reopens, which it appears it's going to, to happen, you know, there are investors that are kind of like coming back and poking around the area. Molly's terrified that her dad's going to run right back to that job. And, and she's tired of watching him kind of be reduced and made into a monster or a machine by that type of work where he has to harm um, ancestral land in the process of what he's doing. So for, for her, you know, she decides to, to, to burn this meltdown, which is a pretty radical act for, for a teenager and a pretty radical act for an indigenous teenager, no less, too. Um, you know, we, we see like acts of arson or environmental uh, sabotage, and they tend to be carried out mostly by like white men when they happen. So for, for Molly, it's not just an act of destruction, it's an act of rebirth and reframing. You know, she is going to, to, to burn the mill down or remove the mill in the hopes that something new can come up in, in the ashes of it, which does happen in the book. And um, I'd be happy to talk more about that or I could, could read a little passage about Molly's kind of character that, that ties into that too. Yeah, let's hear a little bit from Molly. Let's see. Yeah, why not? Yeah, I didn't. You can find this spot. So this is um this is this occurs this this is going back in Molly in, to Molly's point of view and she's kind of going over her process of like what she's doing and why she's doing it. Um, and a little bit later, I'll I'll play an audio clip to you that addresses the fire more directly and, and gets a little deeper into her character. But this is a kind of one of these one of my favorite passages. She spent the summer and fall sneaking into the mill exploring the layout, learning its topography, figuring out what would burn and how, devising a plan. Her goal was not just fire, but rebirth. At night, she peppered her father with questions about plants and gardening, 
and he gleefully went on and on like a man who'd rediscovered an old friend. Pushing deeper inside the abandoned mill site, she planted fire-loving seeds and seedlings wherever she thought the land would support life. She delighted in the small gorilla act of slipping a living pocket of complex DNA beneath the earth of a hulking paper mill, whose days she was convinced were numbered. While most of the world watched the news or dozed off, dreading getting up for work tomorrow, here she was digging holes for shagbark hickory trees and green spaces between maintenance sheds and loading docks. Even with all her planning, most days the fire seemed impossibly foolish. As winter set in, she began picturing the world she was trying to build after the flames. Who knew what seeds would germinate, activated by fire as plants had been for millennia, and what would pass on with the burn? Pitch pine and scrub oak and larch and willow, blazing star and wild lupin and fireweed. If they came, they would come as a tapestry of new life emerging from the ashes. I'll stop there. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um, very relatedly, um, as a writer, can you talk about what it's like to include such moral ambiguity and morally ambigu ambiguous uh, choices in your book? Uh, how do you sort of balance these situations that have very opposing viewpoints and, and things that you might not agree with personally uh, while sort of portraying them in a, in a very compassionate way? Yeah, um, it's fun and it's also it's also kind of scary, um, it's especially when it's one thing when you're writing fiction, it's another when your fiction's being read and you suddenly have an audience. And there's an assumption that um, all, all characters, not, a, not by some, but some, some people assume that all perspectives in a book are, are you know, the author's thinly veiled viewpoints, um, which isn't the case. Uh, but for, for me, like moral ambiguity, um, surprised I said it right, actually. It's a, <laughs> It's a terrible word. <laughs> I always get tongue tied on that too. Uh, it, it's it's kind of at the heart of what makes for good characters, I think. So, like uh, you know, to, to have a character who's all the way bad or all the way good isn't very interesting in fiction. Like you know, what, what makes a character compelling is that gray area, um, their ability to be good one day and then lash out and be bad another day. Um, it's why I think, in many ways, for me, Lyman Creel was probably the most fun and interesting character to write. Uh, in one, one regard, you know, he's a pretty bad dude. He's like kind of, you know, a classic antagonist. He's, he's also a bit of a pariah based on how his community has treated him. He's done a lot of good and noble things too, um, you know, denouncing his family's history with the mills and, you know, taking Grace's last name and trying to distance himself from his own family. But he's, he's a kind of a complicated character and a, a conflicted person in that way. So any, anytime you have a character who's morally ambiguous like the, the next step is to explore issues that are morally ambiguous because I, I don't think things are as much of a binary as like we assume they are um and it makes for really rich fiction uh it can also make for um you know fiction that feels like it's kind of walking the fence and not taking a position but i, I never worry as much about that so yeah it's just um it, it would be boring if it wasn't ambiguous for me at least no, I, I like, you know, going down layer after layer and getting deeper with things with, with fiction. It's one of the pleasures of writing it. Yeah, absolutely. You want to have that complexity, that sort of. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think now's a good time to say that the voices of Penobscot speakers are pretty vital to the story, um, both symbolically and literally, because in the audiobook version, um, some sections are read by Penobscot speakers. Would you like to share a clip of that for us? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I... One of, one of the pleasures of having this book come out was getting to work on the audiobook version of it. Um, it's a totally new experience for me. You know, I had you know, published fiction before, but wow, an audiobook, that's, this is crazy. And HarperCollins was all about bringing in indigenous voices for the audiobook in different ways. And that, that was really important to, to, to me and to them. And a lot of the people that I consulted with on the language um, to, to write the book, because he uses Penobscot here and there, and there were you know, several native speakers that I worked with and um, they worked as consultants for pronunciation on the audiobook, and they also, one of them um, was one of the readers in the book. So what I'll do is play a short clip here, and this is a, a, a letter that Molly sends to the Lowering Days, the newspaper that, that David's mother runs shortly after the fire, which she's kind of claiming responsibility as all this conjecture goes on about what happened. And the first voice you're gonna hear is um, 
the, 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 you know, the, the main narrator, David, David Baker. And the second voice is Nicole Altbetter, who does Molly's part. And she's a Penobscot speaker who, who worked on the book with me. So. Fire. A letter arrived in the mail at the lowering days. It was written on a brown paper bag instead of dioxin bleached white paper. Dear readers, this paper is run by a white lady, but she's a white lady who cares. Her heart is in the right place. She gives us a space to be seen and heard. Will you, Winnie? This paper has also shown it cares about truth for everyone, whether human, white, Penobscot, mountain, tree, river, or air. So this paper gets the truth. Ganudaman, Wazel Mo, Nazibo, Wazel Mo, Bog, Ach, Nadolabam, Bono of Scario, Is Abajile, Agalabamo, Wagaluke, Winila, Bono of Scario, Ada, Abajilaque, Nich, Nawinchin, Bol, Dean, Anna, Ada, Abajilaque, Nij Nalida ha sol tina na Nij nich kin ki Nij o nich ki sol tina Awenucho nagabano wax kiwayo The fire I started was meant for the mill only not to hurt anyone else I acted alone To the mill This is for the river who you harmed my people who you poisoned and all the men and women who had to make themselves into machines to keep you alive I think it's good you're gone. Some things have to stay dead so others can come back to life. To my people, Nudeldaman, Hachi, Kalita Hadaman, the river is us. We are the river. I couldn't listen to your crying anymore. All right. There's a snippet of Molly's voice and um, what's really the tremendous and beautiful language to yeah, that's incredible. They, they do a fantastic job in that. Yeah. Um, now I think is a great time for some audience questions. Again, sure. if you um, would like to unmute yourself or ask Greg directly, I also see a couple in the chat that I'd like to read out and start out with. Um, one is from Andrea. Is the history about the founding of Eastport you write about in the book real or fictional? Yeah. Um, hey, Andrea, that, that's a good question. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, so in the book, it refers to like the story of Joseph East, which is similar to like the, the Joseph Buck Buck story. Um, and, and, you know, there, there was, there was a quite a bit of truth to that. And there's truth too in the geography, like the, the site where the, you know, it's not a mill anymore, but the old paper mill is in Bucksport. You know, that's, that's an area that a long time ago was, at least from what I understand, you know, the Penobscot um, camping ground, and there's a spring there. So, like, you know, Indian Point, um, that that area has like real grounds, a real basis um, in in the geography that I kind of couch it in the book. But yeah, I, I mean, I took some liberties with some of like the Bucksport mythology, um, but but there is definitely some some truth in there. And that's kind of one of the things that I, I like to do throughout the book is, is play a little bit with, with myth and with, with fact and interplay between the two. Um, there's other myths in the book, like the, there's a story of the ghost apple trees and that story kind of gets bandied about and you know who, who has ownership of it is, is kind of a question. But yeah, there's, there's a, I'd say like 65% true maybe. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Andrea also asks, can you talk about Almi's brothers, especially Link and his anger? Where does that come from and what happens to him later? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So there's there's three brothers. Um, there's there's Almi, then there's Link, and then there's Simon, um, who's the oldest. And they're all very different in their personalities. And, and later on in life, um, they all kind of end up becoming a, a part or moving into professional lives that represent like one part of their father. Um, like Arno was a, a combat medic in Vietnam. Um, so, you know, Almi becomes a doctor. Um, 
Link becomes a soldier, and Arno is also a celebrated boat builder, and, and Simon continues his tradition of, of boat building and, and being an artist. But Link's anger, um, Link's the protector of the family. He, he's the, 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 he was always the brother who needed to be hypervigilant. Um, and for Link, like any, anything that came across as potentially a threat was automatically a threat. There was very little like ambiguity for Link about behaviors. Um, and, and I think, you know, his anger just kind of comes from that place of feeling that, you know, his parents are wrapped up in their own lives and they're attentive parents, but they're also highly ambitious parents that are like doing their thing. And the brothers are left to their own devices. And the book doesn't like consciously get into this to a, a great degree, but, but Link feels like he's the one who needs to kind of watch and keep things together. Um, and what, what happens to him later is a, is a good question. Um, he, there was a whole other part of the book that I ended up cutting, which kind of covered the boys' lives in their 20s. And um, it, it just didn't feel like the right movement for the book ultimately. But uh, later, later, later in life, like Link, Link enlists, uh, he's a soldier. And um, in, a, in a prior iteration of the novel, he was wounded in Afghanistan and he comes back home. And he has to kind of come to terms with what it means to be back in the place that made him angry and resentful in many ways and that kind of set him on this path of protecting and he goes and serves and does what to him is an act of protection but is injured and, and can no longer do that after so he's got this kind of um identity crisis that he's he's dealing with but as far as what else happens to Link, I don't know. I mean, this, the story's kind of open there. Um, there's there's kind of an open end to a lot of a lot of the character stories in the book. Uh, people often ask me like, if if I'm going to like write a sequel or anything, and I, I don't have any intentions of doing that. But I will say there are stories in the book that I'm still curious about, even you know, two years after finishing it. Um, like like mainly Grace Creel's story, you know, the aftermath of, of her life after um, after all the events in the book. But yeah, so the link could be anything. It's, it's, up, it's up to you, Andrea, really. Excellent. Any other questions, especially people who want to unmute? I always hang out on mute too when I go to events. I get mm -hmm. it. Uh, thank you everybody for, for listening and for being here too. We're competing with the state of the state address. You know, oh yeah, I, I just, that's I right. Just, just, <laughs> just remember that's going on tonight. Yeah, yeah. I, I just unmuted so I could say that I thought your book was great. And um, I loved, like, even just now when you were talking about Link and what happened to him, I suddenly started to see how he was also um, an embodiment of, um, Creel too that uh, there was just there was a lot of beautiful symmetry in your book and I remember um, being struck with the part where near near the end where um, when David's going off to college and they his uncle and his mother bring him to the burial ground and there's a talk about whether you see life as a circle or an arrow and I just thought you that was so beautifully done. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. And thank you. Yeah, it's it's interesting because like throughout the book, I kind of play with this conscious line of like Almy's always kind of pulled towards Lyman, and there's like a draw between those two. And it's like, what's going on there? Like, why do they have this eerie connection? But you're right, there's there's the parallel and a connection between all of all of the brothers and Lyman. And I think you know, one of the reasons in that early scene when they they first go to you know, Fallon takes the link in uh, Almy to, um, to to Grace and Lyman's house after she's, you know, debating publishing the letter or when she's debating publishing the letter. And, you know, Fallon and Almy go right in and Link like stays outside and he tries to do this like sentinel thing where I'm going to stay outside, I'm going to pout, I'm not going to go in the house, I'm going to remain vigilant, like this is like the enemy's territory or something. And a lot of his resistance um, to going into that house, I realized later as like was developing that scene was his resistance to becoming almost too close to Lyman, who in, in some ways is um, the worst case scenario for, for, for Link. That's who Link doesn't want to end up as in life. So there's all these you know, layers within layers that are right. presenting themselves to even to me now. Any other questions?
I'm going to ask something completely different. Um, why do you yeah. elect, why did you elect to set the book in the eighties? Were there any sort of economic or environmental issues that were on the forefront of the time for you, or was it just completely nostalgia for the time? I think it was, um, I think it was a little bit of both. I mean, it was when I grew, I was born in 82. So it was kind of like the, the main I knew and the, 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 the brothers, like their ages aren't far away from me. It's also a time when certain environmental issues and certain cultural issues in the state kind of came to another head in ways. Um, I mean, the book gets a little bit into the Maine Indian Land Claims Settlement Act, um, which happened in 81 that it was signed. And, you know, it was a, a piece of legislation that, that, that gave the tribes like recognition and it gave them all this financial recompensation, but it also put severe restrictions on their sovereignty. It's still an issue now. Um, you know, there's actually a bill in the legislature and there's a, a public hearing on it on February, I think it's February 15th. Um, and there's, you know, it, it's 40 years later, the tribes are still trying to get the Land Claims Act revised and get sovereignty property rec properly recognized. And at, at the heart of this is, you know, there was a kind of a clause in that settlement that, that the states would be able to treat tribal lands and tribal nations like their municipalities. Which isn't the case. I mean, they're they're sovereign nations. They shouldn't be governed by by state law. But um, so I would highly highly suggest that, that, that people learn more about um, that bill and about that process. Um, Wabanaki Alliance is is a wonderful organization that's kind of spearheading a lot of the the work there. Which I'll throw that in the chat in just a second. Um, so so there were some of these things that were bubbling up. And also like the, the the Clean Air and Water Act hadn't been passed that that long before the 80s. So it's a combination of like political issues and cultural issues coming to a head and just like, that's the time I wanted to write about. Um, so that it's the time I knew. Um, so it's, it's funny, I, I never thought about the time it was gonna be set in. I just started writing and that's when it was. And that sometimes that happens. Other times you make a more conscious decision to be like, well, should this, be 2012 or should this be like the 90s or are we going to like is this going to be a futuristic book it just was the lowering days that's fascinating that it was so instinctual like that yeah yeah let me actually pull the wabanaki alliance website up thank you yeah, chat. yeah. So LD1626 is a really important piece of legislation for, for finally fully acknowledging tribal sovereignty in Maine. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other questions? I got a, a fun piece of news about the lowering days recently, so I'll, I'll share that. Um, it's okay. um, the paperback's coming out in March. Um, so that's exciting. And the, the French edition is coming out in May, which is really exciting. Uh, the idea of having a book in France is super cool. And I just actually um, got a, cop a picture of the French cover about an hour ago. So I'm still kind of geeking out over it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to share my screen. Let's see if I can throw it up here for people to see. It's, it's much different than the US care cover. See how this goes. And all, all these events I've done, I've never shared my screen. So let me see if I can figure it out. Abby in the chat also notes, as a side note, the Audubon Society has a form to help those folks submit testimony on the sovereignty bill. Yes, they do. Um, absolutely. <clears throat> well, it's telling me I need to restart Zoom to make that happen. So, oh well. <laughs> Well, with the news of the uh, paperback coming out, for those who have already read your debut and loved it, or those who may be here and haven't read it quite yet, um, what are you working on now? What's next? Yeah, that, that's always a good question. Um, so I, I've just finished, uh, kind of fin finished editing a link story collection that, that is also set in Midcoast, Maine. Um, so we'll, we'll see how and when that might make its way out into the world. 
And my you know, two big projects now are I'm working on two other novels, um, which is kind of a trip to work on two books at once, but so far it's mostly going well, <laughs> thing back and forth between the two. Uh, one is a, a literary novel, um, you know, it's also set in a small community in Maine. And the other is a bit more speculative in nature. It has some dystopian elements and it, it has a part that's in Maine, but it also travels outside the state. Um, we go to Norway in the book, Canada, Minnesota, California, and there's a, a portion in Belize too. So it's a very different um, piece for Maine, which I'm having a ton of fun writing it, having focused primarily on like Maine-based literary fiction for, for a long, long time. Uh, so yeah, a um, couple other novels in the works and we'll see how long they take. Um, and with, with hope it'll be a little quicker than the lowering days, but I'm kind of notoriously slow, so. Excellent, that sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Any other questions or things to share? I have a comment. Yes, I Deb. I, Deb. <laughs> I, uh, I read your book, I mean, I found it on the new bookshelf at the library and I knew nothing about you. And I love to read Maine writers and, my family's lived in Maine since 1740. So I was really thrilled with the authenticity of, of your book in terms of Maine, because I often find that disappointing in other fiction, but I really felt that you were a Mainer and it was a whole different feeling for me. So I just want to say, I really appreciate it. And I really love the book. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, similar, similar path in my family. Um, I mean, I guess the, according to my aunts, it's, I think it's like 14 generations in Maine. <laughs> it's going, going way, way back, which means there's a lot of history to absorb and work into a book and a lot of um, history that's not all positive to come to terms with too. So, you know, that, that was important also. Um, so that, I really appreciate that because I was always, we're, we're tough as a state. Like we, we ex have high expectations of, of, you know, how people represent Maine and it's a fictional Maine. Like I wanted to get it right. Like the feel of the place that I know and love. Um, so yeah, that's like a great compliment. I think you did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm looking forward to the next one. Cool. Yeah. Glad to know that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Any final thoughts as we uh, start to wrap up? I don't see any more in the chat. Anything less, anything last minute from you, Greg? It's a quiet night, which is okay. I like it. Um, yeah. No, just just thank you. Um, you know, I, I was telling you earlier that so I and some of the audience might enjoy this, but I like obviously we talked about it. I grew up in Belfast, but my, my grandmother was a social worker um, with the state for a long, long time. And she worked at times out of the Rockland office for DHHS. And when I was really little, like we used to do these kind of like library tours through the, the mid coast. And I remember going to the Rockland Library and like going to the Camden Rockport Library in addition to the Belfast Library. So it's definitely nostalgic for me. Um, I think the last thing I, I'd say is I just want to put a book recommendation out um, of a, a novel that's coming out this summer that I think everybody should just kind of have on their radar um, if possible. But, um, you know, Morgan Talty is a, he's, he's a Penobscot writer. Um, he, he lives, he lives up in the Orland area, but he has a story collection coming out, a debut book. It's called Night of the Living Res. Uh, and it's a series of linked, linked stories that are set on Indian Island and, you know, focus on, you know, Penobscot uh, residents on the island. And it's just, he's a wildly good writer. It's a beautiful book. Um, you know, it's coming out with Tin House, which puts out these just really beautiful books. Um, and it's uh, kind of like these, these gorgeous linked literary stories that also are really funny and really sad in ways and kind of turn some genre stuff on their head. So I think it's coming out in July. So it's a ways out, but it's just one I've been, been putting out there for anybody, especially people who are looking for, for main writers. Um, and, you know, so Morgan's a good one. Excellent. That sounds fantastic. Thanks yeah. so much for the uh, recommendation, Greg. And thank you so much for doing this. This is a really oh, fantastic course. night. Yeah. Oh, happy. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Good deal. Uh, well, thank you, everybody. Um, if, if anybody has questions or wants to reach out later, that's totally cool, too. Um, my email address is uh, right on my website, and it's always nice to hear from folks. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you, Em. Thank you, everybody.